So this is why these things are really important. Um, the intake, a greater intake of red and processed meat. Now red meat is considered um, anything that is beef, pork, veal, or lamb. Um, and yes, I did say pork. A lot of people believe that pork is the other white meat. Um, they do a really great job marketing that pork is white meat, but pork is actually red meat in the nutrition world. And then processed meat. Processed meat is gonna be hot dogs, sausages, lunch deli meat, um, these types of products. You know, I live in Wisconsin where it's essentially beer, cheese, and bratwurst, right? A perfect combination for a very, uh, unfortunately, diet that increases the risk of cancer. And the reason for this, and it's not just one reason, but the biggest impact is um, increased level of nitrates and these um, nitrate um, compound formation that can reduce apoptosis, increase proliferation, increase genome instability, and increase inflammation. Now, this is um, where we focus on dairy, and dairy is a hot topic when it comes to nutrition and cancer. And um, so I wanted to kind of set the record straight of like where the current research applies. And right now, um, it's been shown that greater intake of dairy foods increases something called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, which is actually a really well-known um, hormone that's been shown to increase the risk of cancer when we have higher levels of IV this IGF-1. Um, this IGF-1, um, it's believed that um, higher levels come from a greater intake of dairy foods. And um, therefore, there's reduced apoptosis and increased proliferation. Now, it's very important for me as a healthcare professional to show what the other things about the research says. And this is why it gets so controversial when it comes to dairy, is that there is actually strong evidence that the consumption of dairy products and higher amounts of calcium can help protect against colorectal cancer. Now, what I think really needs to be done in this research further is teasing out, is it the dairy products or is it the calcium intake that is protecting against colorectal cancer? In my professional opinion, more research needs to be done. However, there's also limited but suggestive evidence that the consumption of dairy products can increase the risk of prostate cancer, right? So we have some very opposing things here. And therefore, um, the third expert report actually says that the evidence of potential harm means that no recommendation has been made for dairy products. And I think that this is something that um, as reports continue to come out every 10 years, and they actually um, do reports on different individual cancer diagnoses um, between those 10 years, we do really want to pay attention for this information as it comes forward, as we hopefully have more research. And this is where a lot of individuals like to operate out of the precautionary principle, right? There is potential of harm. And therefore, some people are going to opt to have no dairy intake, reduce their dairy intake. And um, to be honest, I believe my role as an oncology dietitian is to present the information and for patients to decide what they do with it. Um, I can bring a, a horse to water, but I can't make it drink. Right. And I think that that's a very important consideration moving forward is that it's my job to teach the information and then also for the patient to move forward with whatever is best for them or what they believe is best for them. All right. Greater alcohol intake. I believe many people are familiar with this, but I'm not entirely sure. Again, I live in the state of Wisconsin where I said beer is a huge alcohol is huge. Um, and the reason why alcohol can increase the risk of, um, cancer is because it, it's elevated acetaldehyde, which is actually the harmful component within alcohol. Um, and then it can also increase estrogen um, in females and also inflammation, also folate deficiency, et cetera. So all of these impacts can lead to increased inflammation, genome, genomic instability, increased proliferation of the estrogen positive tissues. Um, so again, in, in a estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patient, alcohol can drastically increase the production of estrogen. So if we have somebody that has estrogen receptor positive breast cancer history, we want to make sure that we're reducing their levels of estrogen to appropriate levels. And we definitely don't want to increase levels of estrogen because that can increase, um, that's actually estrogen can be a source of fuel for that cancer cell. So really want to be cautious of that. In the um, year 2015, the World Health Organization declared that no amount of alcohol is safe for a breast cancer survivor. Now, when we get into these recommendations here um, a little bit further, because they use, you know, the avail 
available evidence, they actually say that moderate alcohol consumption or minimal should be recommended, which is actually considered two drinks per day for men um, and one drink per day for women. Personally, I think that is still a high intake and that we should try to reduce it as much as possible. I tell my patients, if you don't drink, don't start. (laughs) And if you do currently drink, try to reduce the amount of alcohol that you consume. Um, And of course, here's a positive one here is that greater physical activity can reduce our insulin. It can reduce our estrogen and testosterone levels, and then also reduce inflammation in the long term and improve our immune function, which can relate to increased apoptosis, decreased proliferation, decreased genome instability, and decreased inflammation. So there's a really positive one for you as well. Now to take those a little bit step forward, what the current Penn cancer prevention recommendations are. Um, And I do want to point out that the third expert report says that we only, they only judge, excuse me, the only evidence judged to be strong is usually included in the basis for recommendations. So I do think that over time, as more research comes available, we are going to see different recommendations or these recommendations change over time as hopefully we get stronger research. So that's where you'll see in some of these recommendations, if there's limited or suggested evidence, it's not necessarily usually included in these recommendations. So first and foremost, we know that we want to be at a healthy weight because unfortunately being overweight or obese increases that um, stress on the body, increases apoptosis, or excuse me, decreases apoptosis and proliferation, increases inflammation, et cetera. So the recommendation is to keep your weight within a healthy range and avoid weight gain in adult life. And the recommendation is actually to be as lean as possible without being underweight because underweight can also be very detrimental to our health. Um, So oftentimes, um, I know this is the first and foremost recommendation when we talk about healthy weight, but when I work with my patients, I often don't actually focus on weight. I like to focus on the factors that are going to help um, improve their health overall. And as a side effect, they'll naturally lose uh, or, you know, gain to a healthy, excuse me, not gain. That's the wrong word, achieve a healthier weight. And um, so I don't necessarily focus on the number on the scale. I really prefer to focus on my patients and how they feel. What is, what does their diet look like? What does their physical activity look like? And I think that a healthy weight is just going to be a side effect of that, but also to be noted that, um, when, after people experience, um, cancer and often certain types of cancer treatment, it can be very difficult for some individuals, particularly women to get, to lose weight, to a healthier weight into their survivorship, because perhaps maybe they're on a medication that might increase the risk of weight. Um, or they might have had um, early medically induced menopause by removing their ovaries at a young age to help reduce the estrogen. Um, A side effect of that can be increased weight in life. And so that's something that as oncology dietitians and healthcare professionals, we have to be aware of. And, um, you know, shame is not, not, should not be part of any of this here, but really helping encourage our patients with healthy lifestyle factors. Because research even shows that even if an individual is overweight or obese, they can have really healthy measures of insulin, decreased inflammation, et cetera. Remember, it's not just one factor that plays an entire role. We have to look at the big picture as providers. Um, Also, of course, being physically active as part of everyday life. One thing that I really focus on with my patients is making sure that they're just truly purposely active right? Exercise and like set out structured exercise is fantastic. However, I think we also have to do a better job of encouraging people that just being active, whether it be gardening or walking outside or um, doing certain things to set up your day to be more active is really important. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm standing throughout this presentation, right? I'm in my, my home office and I have you know, a pretty simple setup to put up my laptop to be able to talk to you while I'm standing. And I try to aim to do this as much as possible throughout my day so that I'm standing instead of sitting during my, during my workday. Um, you know, I'm always, we live pretty close to my daughter's school. If the weather's good, I'm always trying to walk there. And that's really just me trying to set up my environment to be purposeful. And so that I'm more active as a result. So it doesn't just have to be this intense, drip sweating workout to count as physical activity. I want people to be more physically active as part of everyday life. And that's what makes a big difference too. Um, Of course, my favorite recommendation here, because it has a lot to do with me as a dietitian is to eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. And that these should be a major part 
of your usual daily diet. Um, so then it goes into recommendations and making sure that we have at least 30 grams of fiber a day, which unfortunately most Americans don't meet, um, but also, you know, making sure we're consuming whole grains, um, beans, and then also um, diets high in all types of plant foods, including at least five portions of servings of a variety of non-starchy vegetables and fruit every day. Also aiming to limit the consumption of fast foods and other processed foods, high in fat, starches, and sugars as much as possible. We want to try to limit these in all of our diets. Um, how awful also, I think it's important to recognize that there is a little bit there, there may be some room in someone's diet for some processed foods, but we want to try to limit them as much as possible, but really processed foods, there's a spectrum of that. Technically speaking, um, you know, bagged lettuce is processed because it's been washed and put into a bag, right? But this is very different than, um, an Oreo or a Twinkie, right? Those are very different processing. We want to try to avoid those ultra processed foods as much as possible. Um, we also, unfortunately, we fortunately, <laughs> we want to make sure that we limit the consumption of red and processed meat as much as possible. Um, it really is uh, recommended to eat little, if any, processed meat. So if somebody is watching this presentation and this is a regular component of their diet, this is one of the first places I recommend people to really start cutting back on is limiting the consumption of red and processed meat. Um, this is very highly connected, especially to colorectal cancers. Also, they'll limit the consumption of sugar sweetened drinks such as soda or pop or wherever you might be listening to this and whatever you call many of these sugar sweetened beverages and trying to consume water, um, unsweetened teas, coffee, even unsweetened are going to be some of the best sources of fluids for you um, to limit alcohol consumption as much as possible. Um, although the if you look deeper into the expert report, it does say two drinks for men and one for women per day. Um, the recommendation for overall is for cancer prevention, it is best to not drink alcohol at all. Mm -hmm.